some who are not in this room uh, making beautiful contributions. So my talk will be about uh, structural fluctuations, but it relies on understanding that that relates to polar fluctuations. I, I, I'm sorry, I, I should have done, said this first. So, so uh, Eddie Rapp's going to talk about uh, a, a new model for a dynamic polar response of uh, PMN PT and its connection to piezoelectricity. And I should say for people here that are coming from the, 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 the all the way over on the experimental end, you're going to see at this meeting that we, we span the full range from devices and applications to you know the intricacies of theory and everything in between. So, so, uh, so, so hang on there. And, uh, and uh, we're going to see some of the uh, uh, bridging of that in this talk. So that. Uh, well, th thank you, Ron. Thank you for the beautiful introduction. And thank you to the whole team of organizers. It's so great that we can be together again and back in our ancestral home. And I mean that in more than one sense here in Williamsburg, Virginia. It's great to see so many friends here. Uh, so yes, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the beautiful work of my collaborators, Ariyuki Takanaka, Ilya Greenberg and Shi Lu, and uh, two of the three of them are here, and two of the three of them now work at the Carnegie Institution for Science, and Ilya is now a professor at Bar Ilan University in Israel. Okay, the uh, relaxer for electrics have uh, been a challenge and an enigma for scientists for half a century. And it is uh, great for us to try to understand what is going on. And there are many reasons why this is difficult to understand, but also many reasons why it's highly worthwhile to understand their behavior um, in, er in order to uh, rationalize their properties, but also in order to chart new directions for the future uh, development of piezoelectric devices that uh, rely on these phenomena. Okay, so uh, since I'm early in the conference, I will make some general comments about relaxer for electrics. Uh, this may be familiar to you. Uh, this type of graph is showing uh, the dielectric constant as a function of temperature, uh, but then you can uh, sweep the electric field at different rates, and you will get a different dielectric constant depending on the frequency. And so for a lower frequency, you'll get a higher dielectric constant, and then for a higher frequency, you'll get a much lower dielectric constant. This graph isn't so easy to see. But the dielectric constant maximum shifts from here to here. And the amount of temperature shift is often used as a measure of how strong the relaxer-like properties are. A conventional dielectric or a conventional ferroelectric would not show such strong temperature and frequency dispersion. And so here is an example. Uh, Ahead. This is considered more of a normal ferroelectric where all the traces for different frequencies lie on top of each other, essentially. And uh, so this is a, a lead magnesium niobium oxide with a lot of lead titanate, but if you include less lead titanate, it shows these uh, uh, frequency dispersion that I was alluding to. Okay, and so in fact, if you monitor this as a function of temperature, uh, three uh, transition temperatures have been characterized, and they go by the names Burns temperature, T star, and freezing temperature. Okay. So, if you take the dielectric constant inverse, one over the dielectric constant, and plot that as a function of temperature, uh, it obeys the Curie-Weiss law for high temperatures, but then you start to see a deviation from this, and the temperature at which you start to see a deviation is referred to as the Burns temperature. Uh, at a uh, somewhat lower temperature, uh, if you uh, conduct acoustic emission experiments, uh, you see uh, a strong emission peak at another temperature, and this has been designated T star. And then finally, uh, as you watch the dynamics, they become non-Arrhenius-like, and they actually obey this fogel fulcher relationship, where it's an exponential of some energy divided by temperature, but it's a shifted temperature. And so this freezing temperature can be picked off uh, from a logarithmic plot of the dynamics. Um, and so this will give you uh, the freezing temperature, the, apparent, the place where there would be apparent divergence in the response time. OK. So this is sort of a conventional description of these experimental properties. 
Why do we get different dielectric response when we oscillate the electric field quickly versus slowly? The idea is, in general, that some of the dipoles team up. And if you start to have many dipoles aligning with each other, they cannot rotate as freely or as quickly as if they were all independent. And that would, in some way, give rise to frequency dispersion, non arrhenius law relationship. And so this is a picture that has been uh, promoted at first by Burns, um, developed in a beautiful way by Wolfgang Kleinmann, and uh, discussed by many in the literature. The idea is that the highest temperatures, the dipoles uh, move so swiftly and freely, it does act like a conventional uh, dielectric. Then as you cool down, as I say, the dipoles start to find each other. There is a random field, there is disorder, so they do not all freeze at once. You get a local arrangement of dipoles referred to as polar nanoregions. So you'll see this abbreviation, P and R, all over this talk and many others at this conference, I suppose. And then eventually you get these uh, polar nanoregions grow and freeze so that they cannot reorient, and that is when you start to see reduction of the dielectric response. So our observations of this material, PMNPT, using molecular dynamics, reinforces a few of these aspects, but uh, calls into question many aspects of this picture. And so that is what I mean by a new uh, view of relaxer ferro. Okay, a lot of work has been done, and so I like to recognize my colleagues and my friends. These are all papers that we read and cite, uh, and many of you are here. You can see your names up in lights, but there are probably other theoretical works in the area of relaxer for electricity uh, that I have not listed, so feel free to uh, bring your work to my attention. I always like to discuss this with all of my colleagues. And uh, this is a good chance for me to acknowledge the work of my collaborators. Uh, so the work I'm talking about today is uh, led by Hiroyuki and uh, with uh, mentorship from uh, Ilya and Shi Lu really got this started in the beginning. Um, Hiroyuki has had a huge impact on our understanding of relaxer for electrics. Uh, and uh, before that, uh, Yang Han Shin was very active in collaboration with Ilya Greenberg. And our work on relaxers goes back to a wonderful collaboration with Peter Davies, uh, and a lot of it was with his student, Pavel Duhas. And then there was even some collaboration with Takeshi Agami in the, in the early book. Okay, so how do we think about relaxer for electrics? How do we come to interpret experimental observables using theory and molecular dynamics? We begin with something I think we can all agree on, the pair distribution function. If we are talking about dipoles, if we're talking about atoms moving off center, that's something moving relative to something else, we must be calculating a pair correlation function. Okay, so the simplest one is to make a histogram of how often are two atoms separated by a certain distance. So that's basically what we have here. And so we tabulate that and we can get a G of R plot. And surely you've seen this. We refer to this uh, in a larger context we could calculate something called the time delay pair distribution function. So it expands this concept simply by saying, what's the histogram of all cases where there's an atom here at time t prime and an atom there at time t prime plus t, a delay of time t, and then make a histogram of these um, so that we can say what's the probability of separation of R and time delay of t. What's the interpretation of that? Those atoms aren't there at the same time. What is the meaning of this? It turns out that this tells us the favorable distances and time periods of vibrational modes between atomic pairs. And in particular, this formula can just be perceived as the zero time delay limit of the time delay pair distribution function. We refer to this as the instantaneous pair distribution function. That's just the terminology. Okay, but then we can also take this time delay pair distribution function and Fourier transform. So we convert to frequency space and get favorable distances and vibrational mode frequencies that relate particular atomic pairs. So these two atoms are moving at a certain distance related by a phonon of frequency omega. 
and a particularly simple limit is to plug in omega equals zero. Then this integral would simply be a sum over all time delays, and we refer to this as the time average pair distribution function. This means time delay average. Yes? Okay. So now, here is how we can analyze the simplest and maybe the most useful pair correlation. We look at the displacements of lead from the center of their cages. So we find the location of lead and the location of oxygen 12. Those are two locations. We make a histogram of those distances. But we don't just take the instantaneous one. The instantaneous one is here in red. We find how displaced the leads are from their cages as a function of temperature. But then we break it up into static and dynamic parts. And I'll remind you that the static part is the zero frequency part. So we've done this time delay averaging of this particular pair distribution. And then we can subtract that from the total to get the dynamic component. And this reveals a relaxer-like feature. As you cool the material down, the lead displacements go up. We all expect this. This is uh, like uh, for electricity coming in. But what's very interesting is this dynamic component rises with lowering temperature. This is very unusual. And then eventually, we have the dynamic component uh, decreasing with decreasing temperature, which is leading to the freezing. And so from this analysis, breaking up the lead off-center displacements, we can find the Burns temperature, the place where this dynamic component has this anomalous rapid rise with lowering temperature. We can find T star as the temperature where static displacements begin to freeze in. And then we denote the freezing temperature as the place where the dynamic component has peaked and is starting to go down, resulting in a significant change of slope of the static and total uh, scattering. Uh, now, I'll note that uh, in a recent talk, my friend Peter Gehring looked at these data and noted that there's some kind of additional anomaly here at 200 Kelvin, which remarkably he also sees experimentally. So we have a homework assignment to go back and figure out what further dynamical change is occurring at this temperature. I, I leave that. Uh, I don't have fur further results to show you today, but this is uh, pretty neat that both the theory and experiment also have this uh, low temperature anomaly. Okay, so uh, for several years, um, my friends have uh, challenged uh, my group to say, you know, if this is really capturing relaxer behavior, does it show the diffuse scattering? And so this is uh, some uh, pictures that were shared with me uh, by Peter Gehring. And so I'm sure you're familiar that diffuse scattering is the X-ray or neutron scattering that falls away from the Bragg spots. And there is a lot of nanoscale information that can be uh, extracted from the diffuse scattering. And people have raised this to a high art form. And in particular, the shape of the diffuse scattering around particular Bragg spots, uh, I think, is particularly important. So here, this uh, is like a square, but it is elongated at the four points. And this is referred to in the field as a butterfly shape. And what I would direct your attention to is the dip between the points here is shallow and deep, and shallow and deep. And then around the 110 Bragg spot, the diffuse scattering is along the diagonal, and it's referred to as a rod shape. So Hiroyuki was the one who led our analysis of the diffuse scattering. Two minutes, no problem. I'm, I'm doing fine. OK, so uh, we ran bond balance simulations. This method was pioneered by Younghan and Ilya and refined in a dramatic way by Xi Liu. And so our largest runs involved almost 2 million atoms uh, for 2 nanoseconds. And we think this is the largest molecular dynamic simulation of a ferroelectric to date. Uh, if there's a larger one, feel free to update me. But uh, this uh, was quite a costly set of simulations. And so what you're supposed to see here is that if you do 36 cubed, it's not that great a butterfly. By the time you get to 64 cubed, you can see the deep divots and maybe shallow divots on the top. And 72 cubed, it's even a little clearer. But we're really just getting there. This is a case where the experimental fluences 
at uh, national laboratories far outstrip the meager theoretical capabilities that we have. And so the, the resolution is just not as beautiful as what you see experimentally. So in the last one minute, I'll show you another pair correlation function that we think is very important and really shows everything. So it's not lead off-centering, it's what direction did the lead move compared to the direction the lead moved in the next one. A conventional ferroelectric, these angles would all be zero. So let's make a histogram of these angles and see how far away we are from zero due to thermal fluctuations, but also due to polar correlations. And this is our results. That at high temperature, on average, the angles are 90 degrees apart. This means that the dipoles are just scattering wildly. They are not correlating. As you lower the temperature, they start to correlate a little bit, and maybe the angle is 80. But what you can see here is a clear pattern when you go to 400, 300, 200, 100. Beyond 6 nanometers, they never become correlated, no matter how much you cool it down. So this means that you have polar nanoregions of size 6 nanometers. Outside that, you're into the next domain. They never correlate with each other. Inside 6 nanometers, they're kind of correlated, a little more correlated, somewhat more correlated, and pretty correlated. But it's still average of 20 degrees apart. So this is not like conventional freezing, all the same. But we have a fixed size of polar nanoregions with some scatter, but they become more and more polar as they go. And as you go from domain to domain, you see what we refer to as small angle domain walls between one domain and the next. They average less than 60 degree angle deflection from one to the next. So this is our new picture of the relaxer ferroelectric. At high temperature, we agree, all the dipoles are free. Then you start to have polar nanoregions, but what's updated is every dipole participates in one of these polar nanoregions. But they're all very diffuse. They align, but only a little bit, like their angle might be 70 degrees on average rather than 90. Then you start to get static displacements coming in, and this is when the polar nanoregions are in similar places from one time to the next, but they can still reorient pretty freely, and then you get to a frozen phase where it's very difficult for them to reorient, but they do not grow without bound. If they grew larger and larger and larger, you would see the diffuse scattering getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and you do not see that. And so what I'm going to put up here is that this theory provides understanding of many different experimental observables and predictive guidance for how to make better relaxer ferroelectrics that could be a key driver of next generation uh, sonar piezoelectric devices. And with that, I will uh, put up my conclusions. The signature of the local distortions is due to multiple domains with small size. There's no nonpolar matrix. The extremely high density of domain walls gives rise to the high piezoelectric response. I didn't get a chance to talk about these water analogies at all. Uh, I will be glad to discuss that with you separately. Uh, the similar dielectric properties of PN and PT arise from similar structure of the idea that you have an ordered domain with the same size that becomes more and more polar as you cool it down. Okay. And I'd like to thank the ONR. And in the early going, there was also some support from the DOE and NSF. And we did uh, computations at the DOE HPCMO. We'd really like to thank them. They've been very generous with computer time. And thank you for your attention. I'll welcome your questions. So, so has really highlighted the, uh, you know, some of the challenges of time and space uh, that we have to deal with. So we'll take some uh, questions. Just, uh, it seems like you also rule out this possibility that PNR size is fixed, uh, but number does increase upon cooling. But it seems like you do rule out that possibility. We have studied PMN. There are things that are possible if it's not a lead-based relaxer. There are things that are possible if you have different compositions. So I'm open to that. For the system we studied, PMN, we think that the number of PM, PNRs and the size is pretty much fixed, but it's how polar they are. So they might be so little polar that it's not really detectable if the average angle is 85. Who cares? But, uh, but it, it, only in that sense would we say the number is changing. Yeah. yeah what about other uh, relaxer systems which are lead-free? Yes. Should then also look at the displacement of the A subject side, or do you think it's more like the transition metal oxygen? I think that when you, it depends on the, on the system. 
Uh, they're the ones that have the sodium and bismuth, and they're one interesting case, and the barium zinc titanate is another fascinating case. That's a very gentle, uh, if you want to say random field, compared with the lead-based ones. And so we think that the phenomena could be quite different. Um, we think that the, these governing principles are likely to continue to hold, but I haven't proven that here. The idea that the PNR size may be uh, fixed by disorder, and then the extent of correlation changes with temperature, rather than the size of the regions changing dramatically. But I look forward to examining some of those other systems. Yeah. Uh, it's certainly possible, yeah. This is not a universal theory. I mean, this builds in the microscopic features of this system. But we think we've extracted some general principles that we can at least go and look. How applicable are they to other classes? Can you tell? Ben. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've heard about it during all of these. Well, no, I'm just going to say it's recorded crystal. And I'm wondering if you've tried making movies from one of the mixed sites to see if you get the same sort of thing we get in our movies of the PNR in the, um, what you're calling the relaxer region above the key star, um, uh, having essentially fixed, uh, fixed location, spatially fixed, but, but being orientationally disordered. Yeah. Uh, we don't have the kind of structure that you have. I've, I've studied your papers in detail where you have ordered scandium and niobium and then you have disordered scandium and niobium. And that's physically relevant for that system. Here, we have every second site is a niobium, but the other sites are either titanium or magnesium. But if we make a, spher on, if we make a spherical lasso that's even one nanometer in diameter, we will get the same composition for any one of those lassos. You see? Composition is fine. The thing is, you're, you're going to have more ordered regions and less ordered regions within the mixed layers. And so if you look at a mixed layer, you will probably see the way that the PNR um, Our mixed layers would be 111 planes, but then the very next 111 plane is a disordered one. And the... Well, just look at one plane. We could certainly do that. Um, but uh, the biggest dipoles are the leads, and so what I've plotted here today are the lead dipoles. But uh, um, are you suggesting we look at the B-site dipoles? Uh, oh, okay. Well, you look at the leads close to one of the mixed layers. I'd be, I'd be happy to do that. We can talk about that more offline. Uh, but for us, the polar nanoregions are much, much larger than the interlayer spacing, and so the correlations, I think, mostly ignore uh, that. But, but let's look at it. That's a good idea. Yes? Coming at it from a device engineering point of view, what you're saying is that if I measure a PCT capacitor, a PT capacitor, and a PMET PCT, I get But the geometry of the domains inside are rather different. And how does this affect the long-term reliability of the memory person? I want to know what happens five years from now if they're both sitting on the shelf. Oh, uh-huh. Um, I think I would say several things. I think that PMN is much more susceptible to the way it's cooled. That if you initially make it and cool it under electric field, you imprint a polar direction uh, that is difficult to recreate just by applying electric field at moderate temperature. That's one thing. Um, I think that the magnesium sites are highly resistant to ferroelectricity, and so the ferroelectricity is much less robust than it is in PZT. PZT has a higher TC. So PMNPT has many features that are suboptimal for a long-term memory storage because it has the lower TC. I think it would have the less good uh, polar state retention, which I think is what you're asking about. Well, actually, not even the, uh, the curie temperature, but just the size of the domain. Have, if you're saying PMMPT, the domain size were small and randomized, <coughs> while well, totally the photographs of PZT will go electric to electro and, and, and fill up oh, yes. the capacitor. Yes. From a thermodynamic point of view, the PMMPT may be polar. PZT is very likely. 
it's not going to depolarize, but it's going to stay.